So I am very pleased to introduce uh, Matthew Brett. So Matthew is a lecturer at the University of Birmingham. And I hope I get this right, Matthew, you are developing new methods for uh, teaching computing and data analysis for undergraduates. So over to you, Matthew, for a talk on data science methods for online teaching. Uh, okay, yes, thanks. Um, I don't know, I mean, um... Uh, I, I'm using methods which are quite similar to methods that other people have shown here, very impressively. Um, I'm going to, I hope, distinguish myself by doing two very unwise things in this talk. So the first one is that I'm going to briefly discuss what is data science. And the second one is that I'm going to try and do a live demo where you can join in and try out a server that I just set up uh, about uh, an hour and a half ago. So obviously the chances of that failing are very great, but I hope that you'll enjoy uh, watching me crash and burn. So I'm just going to share my screen, I think. Oops. So I'm going to start with some slides, though. Um, and uh, here they are. So um, this is the what is data science bit. Um, I'm really sorry if this is all terribly obvious and old hat to you, but it seems like a big issue to me, which is um, uh, I'm using data science to mean a certain way of teaching, um, more or less. And I, and I got that usage um, from when I was at, um, at Berkeley and watching the data science program there. Um, but of course, in general, I'm also actually a fellow of the Turing Institute until the end of October. And um, I think the standard sort of use of data science in, uh, in the UK is kind of the old fashioned one of sort of you know, machine learning and big data. And this is just a quote from David Donahoe, who's um, a computational statistician at Stanford, uh, saying that he thinks that's a really big mistake. Um, sort of going for this sort of limited view of data science as basically being some more or less a sort of computer science discipline with some statistics in it and uh, big data. So I'm using a very different sort of meaning for data science, and I, I'm sure you would too, but just thought I'd say it out loud. Um, and so the meaning of data science that I'm going to use here is uh, using it as an approach to the practice and understanding of data analysis that is founded in code. Uh, if you're interested in some arguments as to why that is the correct meaning of data science, then um, you know, please follow this uh, link, which you can't do, but I will send the presentation uh, later. So uh, my model here, as I said, is um, there's this, this huge data science program in Berkeley, um, for, which is, I think, very impressive. Um, and um, they have been thinking a lot about you know, what, what this is. And there's a lot of sort of really excellent sort of quotes from um, the people who are running this program about what, how they think data science will change teaching. Um, and, and my favorite is, I think, teaching statistics assuming computers exist rather than assuming they don't exist. Um, but this involves sort of changing the way that you express um, statistical problems, expressing them in terms of algorithms, expressing them in terms of code instead of informally. Um, and again, there's some excellent references from experienced teachers of statistics who've been saying for some time that we need to, we need to move that way. Uh, to make it easier to explain many of the concepts in data science. Um, and this is relevant to online teaching because um, they basically, Berkeley's got a no requirements uh, for foundation of data science course for first and second year uh, undergraduates, which is absolutely massive. So it's, uh, this is their largest lecture hall, which is basically a concert hall. There's 900 people who fit in this, but in fact, the whole course is 1,500 people. Uh, and so they have to do sort of something very similar to what we're going to have to do in terms of online teaching. They've had to do it for a while now. Um, and so what I'm now going to do is take you to a system which is basically uh, based on a recipe uh, from the Berkeley material. So they, they produce a recipe for setting up this sort of online system that they have. Uh, and I'm going to encourage you to go to this link. So I'm going to uh, copy that link and I'm going to put it into, this is where the problems are likely to arise. I'm going to put it into the chat. Uh, so if you could go to that site, I'm hoping that you can join me where I'm going to be. And so uh, if you go to that site, you will find this GitHub page. And uh, this gives you instructions as to how to go onto this system, uh, as I say, which is set up using uh, the recipe for the same kind of system that Berkeley uses for its instruction. Uh, so you click, you're going to need this password, Talmo Workshop, or one word, or lowercase. And I'm just going to go through that now. So I'm going to put in my email address. So you put in your email address. Please don't put in my email address, otherwise things will get very confusing. Uh, it doesn't really matter what it is as long as it uniquely identifies you. And then put in the password. 
which I've just typed in, and then click on this. Now, if you're very lucky, um, then you should see what I'm seeing now, uh, which is uh, basically Google spinning up a virtual machine for you uh, to run the code examples. Now, this th this is you know quite similar to uh, the kind of R Studio server stuff that uh, Mina and others uh, are using. Um, I'd say there was two sort of you know interesting. Oh dear, that's not even working for me. Uh, I'm going to reload that. Gosh, I didn't expect it to go wrong so quickly. Okay, that was very quick. So I'm going to uh, run it not locally. So should that have worked, uh, you would have got uh, this thing running. Um, I'm sorry, it uh, looks like that's not working for many of you uh, or for any of you, but it isn't working for me. Um, but what happens is that uh, when the system is working, as I say, I've, I've just set this up so I'm getting used to making it work. What happens is that basically all of the code, everything else is running in the web browser, the student needs no setup at all. And they get this interactive code execution system. So I think there's, there's two interesting variants from what you've seen before. I think the first is that um, it's, in, it's in Python. And the second thing is that uh, it's a sort of slightly different way of doing things than Learn R, for example. So it's a kind of mixture between a notebook with scaffolding, but also tests to sort of make sure that the student's kind of on track. So I'm just going to kind of quickly go through an example, which is in fact from the Berkeley textbook, um, just to show you kind of how this kind of thing works. So what I'm doing here is I'm pressing Shift Enter to run through the cells here. This would you know, generally work and does work for the, for the Berkeley team uh, for, um, uh, for running uh, sort of in the web on, you know, on big servers in Google and Microsoft and so on. And so you run through the explanation of the problem. And in this case, the problem is, uh, say from the Berkeley course, which is uh, a, a real case. So it was a um, death penalty handed out to a young black man who had an all white jury and the eligible jurors uh, for the place that he was in, in Alabama, 26% uh, of those eligible jurors were black. So the question that the Supreme Court had to address was whether the jury selection was biased or not. So this gives us a very good opportunity to think about uh, the null hypothesis, you know, the, 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 the null world, the, the world where there is no bias and ask ourselves whether um, you would expect that result, zero out of 12 uh, black jurors in that null world, the ideal world where there's no bias in the jury selection and every juror has got a 26% chance of being black. So uh, what you can do then is this kind of thing where you, you, load, up, you load up some boilerplate code, which uh, we don't propose to explain to the students. And th this, by the way, is, is a bit you know, further, I mean, probably about maybe two weeks into the course uh, when the students have already got a little bit used to using code. So you first introduce the idea of uh, making a random number and show them the recipe for that and then you get them to run it a few times. And this is a random number between one and 100 because we're gonna take a random number between one and 100. And if the number is less than uh, 27, so between one and 26, that's a black juror. And uh, otherwise it's a white juror. So those are the numbers. And then the, we introduce the idea of an array. So now we've taken 12 uh, numbers between uh, one and 100. And the numbers that are less than 26, that one, for example, represent a black juror and the numbers that are greater than uh, 26 uh, represent a white juror. And then you can just show them a simple recipe for saying, uh, asking code to tell you which ones are greater than, uh, less than uh, 27, so between one and 26. So a true here means that our simulated jury um, uh, had a black juror in it, um, and a false um, means that the, that particular juror was white. And then we can just count how many trues we've got to, to count how many black jurors uh, we got in this simulated jury. And then, of course, we can just get them to run the thing over and over again. And this is quite useful because they get to see how randomness works. So I'm going to run this over and over again by pressing Control Enter. You can see that you get numbers like two, three, four, and they get this idea of the sort of the randomness in sampling. And then finally, although this takes a little bit more introduction, you can kind of show them the general idea that you can just get the computer to do this lots and lots of times. In this case, getting the computer to do this exact same thing 10,000 times. Uh, and so, one of the things which is quite notable there is I'm just going to run it again. It takes much less than a second. And I think this is actually quite useful for the students because they start realizing, you know, just how powerful a computer is, how, how easy it is, it is to do things many, many, many times. 
And so what we've done now is done simulated a jury 10,000 times, counted the number of black jurors in that simulated jury and stored the results. So we've got 10,000 counts now. So uh, there are the uh, first 10 of the 10,000 counts. And you can see we've got the same kind of range. But like if I run the thing again to get another 10,000 juries, I'll get another set of counts. And then finally, of course, we want to see the histogram. And this is quite revealing, right? Because this is the sampling distribution. And we see that this is the range of answers you get for how many black jurors would we expect in this situation, in this ideal world. And then we get the idea of the p-value. So how uh, many times do we see zero in this sampling distribution in the real world? And the answer is we see it about 287 out of 10,000 times. And then finally, uh, we then have a p-value, which is what's the probability of seeing zero uh, black jurors, uh, i.e. how often in a, a random sample of 12 jurors would I see zero? And the answer is you know, roughly 3% of the time. So that's also our p-value. So we've introduced the sampling distribution, we've introduced the null hypothesis, we've introduced the uh, p-value. Now, the, one of the nice sort of variants of this, and I think this is, you know, I think slightly different from the sort of learn R type approaches, uh, and I think it's also quite nice, is, is putting sort of um, auto grading machinery inside the thing that the students are using. So here, again, a little bit of boilerplate, uh, that's quite surprising, a little bit of boilerplate uh, to uh, load up the libraries needed here, but now we can just get the students to uh, do exercises uh, on their own, but with some support. So uh, here I'm showing them uh, introduce a different question. So let's say uh, we have a family and we know the family has four children. So uh, the question is, what is the probability that uh, that family will have exactly three girls? And we use the same machinery. So the first thing I do here is introduce them to the idea of getting a random number, which is either zero or one using exactly the same machinery as we saw before. But now we can ask them to sort of edit. So here we give them a little bit of code to say, well, this is the thing you saw before, which is a random number between one and a hundred. How would I make uh, this code make 12 num uh, four numbers between uh, zero and one? And you know, of course they just have to sort of basically follow the recipe like that. Well, let's make it five. So if I run that and then uh, run this thing, this is a little auto grader chunk, which checks whether they've got the right answer, meaning that you know, they have to, or at least they would probably want to, make sure that they've got the right answer here so that they don't get stuck uh, when they go further on. So here's changing it to the correct answer, and the auto grading should now tell them that they're okay. And then with a little bit more scaffolding, uh, you might find uh, uh, that they can get a little bit closer to the answer that they want. So in, that, in this case, we want to compare the um, number to one, one means uh, a girl, um, so we want to count how many ones there are, and that's just sort of following the same kind of recipe that they, they've seen above, but using a, a different operator, and again, checking whether that works. And then finally, we can get them to sort of do the, the whole thing, so they just do the, the edits that they need here um, to fully answer the question in hand, which is, whoops, that's not correct, why not? Yeah, okay, uh, I don't know why that isn't correct. Somebody else can, yes, that's why. No, that's, yeah, anyway. Okay, so, um, but anyway, so that's uh, basically the end of my presentation. It was just to give an idea of the kind of things that uh, you can do with a, uh, a setup like this. As I say, I'm just experimenting with this, but Berkeley's had this running for a long time. And, and the advantage of this kind of setup is it allows you an almost infinitely flexible set of tools that you can run just in the web browser uh, with a lot of sort of scaffolding and support which allows them to sort of run exercises and not get too stuck. So just the last thing to say is that um, uh, in this uh, system you can also for example run uh, RStudio which is also set up in the system that I was looking at before this all crashed. Okay that's uh, the end of my talk. Did that work for anyone? Or was, uh, was I the only person who got stuck there? It didn't work for me, but... <laughs> no, okay. Yeah, that's, that's interesting, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing the questions for this chunk, um, of which we have precisely none. So <laughs> what a, what I'm going to yeah. ask you one and hope that some other people put some up in the meantime. So all of that's done with Jupyter Notebooks, yeah? Is that correct? Yeah. 
so um, I, I was running it when the server crashed. I started running it online, which is what, in fact, I've been doing. Sorry, I mean, sorry, on my laptop, on my computer, um, but um, and which is what I was doing last year. But uh, this year, I think um, it's much going to be much harder to support the students getting that stuff set up. Um, so I'm going to switch to a system like this where all of the setup is done basically in the cloud. Um, so my question was really about how much the university support you with that infrastructure or whether this is all a bit kind of you know one man standing to get the technology up and running uh well it's a sort of combination so um uh, I'll, I'll put links to this but this is something that berkeley is very keen to encourage other people to do so they've got a recipe for setting this thing up and so i mean i've got a lot of experience in this kind of stuff um, but um, but there are quite a lot of people who have an, the same amount of you know equivalent amount of experience to me. Uh, I've no doubt that you know those of you who are using LearnR and so on would be able to set this thing up at least with some support. Um, so this is a kind of it is kind of likely to be a do-it-yourself option unless you've got a particularly cooperative sort of IT research software engineer um, set of people. It's relatively cheap, um, but it does it probably costs you know about a thousand dollars to keep the thing running with an extra 500 unless you're really hitting it hard maybe a bit more so it's so something like maybe two thousand dollars a month a, a term for maybe if um, you know several courses not with not very high demand okay we have some have some proper <laughs> proper questions <now. laughs> um so an anonymous question is uh, are there advantages of Jupyter notebooks as opposed to other tools for R such as R markdown I guess learn R would be the obvious one as well as people have already talked about that well I, th I think learn R is a different kind of thing so I, I've used datacamp for the same kind of thing as for learn R so it's, it's much more sort of like a, a sort of quizzy sort of setup it's not really for you to develop your own stuff I, I think this is this is slightly less scaff this is less scaffolded and so it's much more similar to an R notebook um, which I also use. I mean, um, I think the Jupyter Notebook is a little bit like it's quite easy to get kind of um, a lot of my students get messed up with, a, you know, knocking off a back tick in an R notebook and nothing working. And then, you know, they got completely lost and it's sort of um, editing everywhere. Um, so I think a Jupyter Notebook is just a little bit easier for the absolute beginner. And then there's, then there's the fact it's it's Python. So I think that has, you know, uh, pros and cons. I think the pros are pretty compelling, um, um, but you know, uh, there's definitely cons as well. Okay. Um, Simon White has asked, uh, curious regarding the check code blocks, what sort of flow chart of mistakes do they accommodate? Uh, yes, I mean, basically anything at all. So if you know how to, um, well, so what, what happens is that um, you write little test functions and the test functions get have the results of uh, the code that's run. So they can look at the variable you define, so they look at all the other variables you've got to find in the notebook and you can test lots of different things. So typically tests have got multiple stages. Is it a variable defined? Is it in the right ballpark? You know, is it correct? You know, that kind of thing. So it's, it's kind of up to you. Uh, the test format thing is, I think, less opaque than um, equivalent kind of tests in sort of, for example, tests uh, R frameworks. Um, but it's a little bit kludgy, but it's quite easy to see what's going on. But as I say, the flexibility is, is really rather great. And it's, my... it's more of a sort of Heath Robinson sort of <laughs> the thing, I, I think. But but I, that has some advantages. It's it's uh, harder to get confused. Yeah. Uh, my clock puts us at three, so should we move on? Yes, I think that's a good idea. And there are some actually more questions now in the Q&A. So perhaps, Matthew, if you have time, you'd like to have a look at those and uh, potentially answer some of those. That'd be great. 